Hi, this is Phil Leach. In this session, as we continue uh, to consider Luke, what I'd like to do is to look at one of the distinctive features of Luke's Gospel, and that is the way he speaks about the Jerusalem and the Temple. Now, uh, in Luke's Gospel, the number of references to Jerusalem are around about 30, uh, maybe just a little bit over. A lot of references to Jerusalem, and many of them, of course, are just talking about Jerusalem as a city uh, but what Luke does is he has these references that speak of Jerusalem uh, in in a way more than that Jerusalem who uh, kills the prophets and uh, Jesus weeps over Jerusalem judgments coming on Jerusalem and uh, even as we see the conflict of the uh, religious authorities against Jesus so as you move through Luke's gospel that it culminates in Jesus weeping over Jerusalem and the judgment on Jerusalem and the judgment uh, on Jerusalem brings an end to the temple and that is significant in Luke's bigger purposes because when you move into Acts the biggest speech in the whole of the book of Acts is Stephen's speech and this, the point of Stephen's speech when you read through it all is that God no longer lives in a temple uh, in, in a building made with hands in other words there is a shift that is coming and Luke in his work shows that the followers of Jesus are the Israel of fulfillment they are the culmination of everything the Old Testament was pointing towards first, first of all of course in the person of Jesus he was the perfect Israelite he was the sum of everything that Israel was moving towards but then beyond Jesus uh, those who were his followers would be those that would go into the nations and take the good news and, and reach the world which uh, is so much of the focus of, of Luke's material both Luke and Acts when you put them together and so uh, what I'd like to do is just to uh, talk about this because in this is some of the most difficult uh, passages in Luke some of the more difficult to understand and, and uh, dare I say too some of the most controversial because some of these passages are often taken to be speaking about the second coming of Christ and uh, I would suggest that that's not necessarily the case now of course Luke does talk about the second coming of Christ and uh, in the book of Acts his second work we read the second account of Jesus being taken up to heaven uh, Luke does that in at the end of Luke's gospel uh, that's how he finishes his gospel uh, how at 2450 uh, he led the disciples there out to the Bethany and he was carried up into heaven and in connecting Acts with Luke we have uh, an account again of this and in chapter 1 verse 11 we read about these two men in white robes and they say why do you stand looking up towards the heaven this Jesus who's been taken up from you to heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go out so the, the second coming of Christ of course is a big feature but um, it's not always easy to know which passages are actually addressing that or whether they're addressing something else so uh, we'll be looking at some of those passages and, and talking about that but just to say all the way from the beginning of Luke we get this this glimpse that, that there is something awful going to happen uh, and we get it right back in chapter 2 when Jesus is taken into the temple to be presented and um, there's a purification rite you remember there's Simeon there and when he sees the child he blesses the child and he says this in chapter 2 verse 34 this child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and, a, he, and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thought of many will be revealed and then he says to Jesus mother a sword will pierce your own soul too and of course we know as Jesus saw her son die on the cross uh, this is a very vivid description of that when it comes to John the Baptist he uh, in the line of the Old Testament prophets were speaking words of judgment and, and even as Jesus omitted uh, as I mentioned before in his uh, 
the declaration of his mission there in the temple oh sorry in the synagogue of Nazareth even as he made the statement from Isaiah 61 that he was there to proclaim the years of the Lord's favour and to not and he omitted to say the day of vengeance of our God we have John the Baptist who is speaking about that and he talks very clearly about the axe being laid at the tree and during the lifetime of Jesus it was a message of good news and of grace uh, but uh, as we read the prophecies of, of Jesus uh, about the future of Jerusalem and judgment then we know that there was going to time going to be a time when judgment came now before we look at these specific passages I just want to draw your attention to the chapter 7 uh, chapter 7 is interesting chapter 7 verse 18 because the very John the Baptist that had identified Jesus uh, as a Messiah and declared him to the world and prepared the way for him when he was in prison he indeed had doubts whether Jesus was the one so much so we read that he sent the disciples to ask whether Jesus was the one uh, chapter 7 verse 19 are you the one who is to come who is to come or shall we wait for another and um and we have to ask the question why would he have done that uh, Luke then in a masterful way goes on to say verse 21 Jesus had just been curing many people of diseases, plagues and evil spirits and had given the sight to the many who were blind and so uh, in response to John the Baptist's question rather than saying yes or no he simply says to the disciples go and tell John what you have seen that the blind have received their sight the lame walk the deaf are cleansed and uh, sorry the, the, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised and the poor have the good news brought to them and um, and what he's doing he's pointing to the passages in the Old Testament like Isaiah 35 5 and 6 and Isaiah 61 1 and 2 and Isaiah 42 verse 7 and others that talk about the, that the Messiah would do these things so he's basically saying to John the Baptist or to the disciples of John the Baptist you go and tell John the Baptist that I am fulfilling that which the Old Testament says about the Messiah now interestingly enough the reason that John probably sent Jesus to uh, sent his disciples to Jesus was because uh, he was expecting more and uh, it's well known that the uh, disciples uh, sorry the Jews at this time and I've probably mentioned this already the Jews at this time were looking for a Messiah but they were looking for that conquering Messiah to deliver them from the Romans and to bring judgment uh, on the nations and, and there was John the Baptist in prison and Jesus left him there he hadn't done anything to see him freed uh, John the Baptist was put there unjustly unrighteously by Herod and Jesus had done nothing and so probably what we have here is, is, is John the Baptist wondering whether Jesus was the one but I want to draw your attention to verse 23 of chapter 7 because after having given this message to the disciples of John he says this and blessed is anyone who takes no offence in me in other words there may be those who take offence because I'm not the kind of Messiah doing the kind of Messiah things that people want they may take offence but blessed are those who do not take offence and as we read through this chapter uh, we, uh, we find that Jesus talking to the crowds and uh, uh, talking about how John came with one particular way uh, that is more of the Old Testament prophet and uh, people didn't receive him and then Jesus comes in a different way and uh, people haven't received him and uh, it's like Jesus is saying you cannot be pleased verse 31 uh, you know John came eating uh, no bread and drinking no wine and I've come eating and drinking and you can't be pleased but he says at the end verse 35 nevertheless wisdom is vindicated by her children in other words those who believe in me will be vindicated now I mention these things as a backdrop because 
um, throughout this section uh, we have this is the the Galilean section of Luke we have Jesus working these miracles questions raised about him and whether he's the Messiah or not uh, some following him and as I've mentioned before it wasn't just 12 uh, Luke gives us a large crowd that followed Jesus uh, verse chapter 6 verse 13 we read that he called his disciples and chose 12 from them and we read in verse 17 chapter 6 there was a great crowd of his disciples so on the one hand there was this crowd following Jesus but what Luke does in this Galilee narrative is gives us lots of times when there was conflict and this conflict was growing uh, we read it right from really chapter 517 uh, that is, is the first instance apart of course from the Nazareth uh, uh, instance that we've, we've mentioned in a previous session but we have this conflict against Jesus and it, it grows and it grows and then uh, when we move into the travel narrative as it's called 9 through 19 we begin to get some uh, significant uh, uh, passages where Jesus is talking about the judgment that is going to come on Jerusalem because they have rejected their day of visitation and so uh, there's uh, all of this talk and, and discussion who is Jesus and, and, and people being offended by him because he wasn't what they he wasn't what they thought they sh he should be and others accepting him and so there's a real mixture here but it would seem that the nation as a whole represented uh, in the Pharisees, the Sadducees and the leaders of the nation were moving to reject Jesus they didn't uh, accept him and so uh, if you turn please to 1331 this is in the travel narrative one of these first passages uh, and it's when uh, there's an encounter uh, with uh, the Pharisees who were warning Jesus about Herod how uh, Herod wanted to kill him and um, and Jesus response uh, was that he was going to go on and do the things that he was going to do and and he's going to go on his way and nothing would stop him verse 33 of chapter 13 yet today tomorrow and the next day I must be on my way uh, because he had to get to Jerusalem because it was impossible for a prophet to be killed outside Jerusalem and and this is uh, uh, Luke Luke's focus here on Jerusalem the center of Judaism and uh, and as you look into Acts it becomes a source of persecution against the the, the, the Christians the early church uh, it, it, what, what we have here is, is Jerusalem as being uh, Jerusalem in a negative sense being talked about and addressed now uh, it, it's very moving because in this passage we see the heart of God in Jesus uh, with regard to Jerusalem it's important for us to understand that judgment was coming on the Jewish nation because of the rejection of their Messiah but this judgment was not coming from a harsh vindictive God but we see that this judgment was coming through Jesus uh, uh, was coming uh, but it was coming from a broken heart and uh, what this passage reminds me of is a previous time when Jerusalem was judged and we have the prophet Jeremiah who is also bringing God's word over Jerusalem and Jeremiah has been known as a weeping prophet and Jeremiah is fascinating because as you study this book the thing that grips you is how reluctant God was to bring judgment on Jerusalem and in, in Jeremiah you have chapter after chapter of Jeremiah pleading with the people and the kings and the leaders to repent and turn from their idolatry 
so they could serve God and the judgment would be averted and there's times in Jeremiah when he speaks about tears rolling down his cheeks and, and grief and pain over Jerusalem and over all that was going to happen to Jerusalem and the genius of this is that as you read it you're not really sure who's doing the talking is it Jeremiah or is it God are, are those Jeremiah's tears or are they uh, uh, tears of, of God as he weeps over Jerusalem and here is Jesus uh, on his way up to Jerusalem in this travel narrative that speaks of Jerusalem verse 34 he says Jerusalem Jerusalem the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it how often I've desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wing and you were not willing this graphic picture of a hen uh, having the chicks under her wing I remember a few years ago when I was uh, in Ghana I remember sitting out in the courtyard of the place where I was and there was uh, a hen sitting there just sitting there and as I watched I noticed these little fur balls come out from underneath her wings and, and I was reminded of this passage uh, and the ones in the Psalms that speak about God as the mother hen who wants to protect and care for the chicks and and this is a very powerful picture here Jesus had wanted to come and take Israel and protect it and look after it but the thing was they were not willing and um, and so we see verse 35 that your house is left to you these words are so powerful because it's talking here about the temple and it's no longer God's temple but it's your temple your house it's left to you and I tell you you will not see me until the time comes when you say blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord now this is a quote uh, from Psalm uh, 108, uh, 118 and it's uh, actually quoted five times all of, the all of the gospel writers quote this when Jesus went into Jerusalem uh, his triumphal entry as it's called and so it's twice in Luke it's here and it's in chapter 19 verse 38 but it's also in Mark 11 9 Matthew 21 and uh, it's also in John 12 so we have a Jesus saying uh, that uh, uh, there will come a time when people will say this to him and this is it would seem to be a prophecy of what would happen in a few chapters time but we know that that, that praise and acclamation of Jesus uh, really didn't last long because very quickly there was a crucifixion and so this is one passage we have with Jesus lamenting uh, over Jerusalem there's some significant parables that speak of the judgment that's coming and I draw your attention to 14, 15 following the parable of the great dinner and uh, it's speaking there about Israel that reject the call and uh, what happens is the the host sends out to bring uh, the poor, the crippled, the blind in and uh, what it says at the end verse, 30, uh, verse 24 for I tell you none of those who are invited will taste my dinner and, and it's a, one of the parables that is alluding uh, to the judgment uh, that is coming now one of the more difficult passages is in uh, chapter 20, uh, chapter 17 and it's verse 20 following uh, to the end of the chapter to verse 37 and, and I would encourage you just to, uh, just to stop the recording and to read this through uh, so you're familiar with it and then we can consider it together now the first paragraph of this section uh, 1720 to 21 
is talking about the nature of the kingdom and this of course is a big discussion and we have touched on this when we talked about parables some passages talk about the kingdom uh, that is uh, uh, now and indeed Jesus had done that in Luke 11.20 we have the situation where the Pharisees had said that Jesus is the drives out um, it drives out demons by the power of of uh, Beelzebub and uh, Jesus' response is this in verse 20 but if it is by the finger of, the, of God that I cast out demons then the kingdom has, of God has come to you in other words the kingdom is now uh, yet the kingdom of God is future and uh, in chapter 19 we have uh, a, a very significant parable that's talking about that and the reason the parable was given we read was because people supposed the kingdom of God would appear immediately and so we get this contention of the kingdom of God both now and future and as I say we've discussed that but uh, the Pharisees ask the question when is the kingdom of, uh, of God coming? And again we need to understand that they were thinking almost certainly the same way as John the Baptist. When is it that we're going to see the rule of God come? The Messiah bringing the rule of God over the oppression of the, the uh, Roman invaders and to establish righteousness and deal with wickedness and all these things that they were hoping for. When when would the kingdom of, uh, is the kingdom of God coming and Jesus answer is very significant because of course the nature of the kingdom was very different to what they thought there is going to be a time when all these things will be dealt with in the future but the kingdom the rule of God had broken in and it had broken in, uh, in, in as, as people had accepted Jesus as their king and uh, accepted his rule and so the answer Jesus gave them is the kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed in other words th there's going to be no sign there's going to be no great event uh, but rather uh, nor excuse me nor will they say look here it is or there it is in other words don't be looking for some person who's going to rise up as a military ruler and say come here because we are going to establish the kingdom as many had done uh, from the zealot band uh, at that time no for in fact the kingdom of God is and then there's various possibilities here within you or in the midst of you or among you and and my suggestion uh, is that the the best rendering is not the kingdom of God is within you because Jesus was addressing the Pharisees who were not walking or were not followers of Jesus so as unbelievers he would hardly say the kingdom of God is within you better probably is the kingdom of God is among you and he said that because he as a king stood among them and he was demonstrating the kingdom in, the, in, in his life and in the way he was acting and speaking and saying and the things he, were doing, he was doing and then uh, when we move on we read verse 22 that the disciples speak to him now and they say uh, uh, and the disciples sorry and he said to the disciples now Jesus speaking to the disciples the days are coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. They will say to you, look there or look here, do not go, do not set off in pursuit. In other words, if people are claiming to be bringing in the kingdom, if they are claiming to be establishing the rule of God, then don't go running after them don't go in pursuit because 
as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side of the to the other so will the son of man be in his day in other words you will not miss it don't think you have to run somewhere to find the day of the son of man don't think you need to do that when it happens you will not miss it before the day of the son of man and we can uh, discuss what that means in a few moments before the day of the son of man uh, there must be uh, sorry uh, but first there must be much endure much suffering but first he must endure much suffering and be rejected by this generation now we know that Jesus used the phrase the son of man to refer to himself and so we have to ask the question what does the day of the son of man mean and it's generally understood and I think rightly that the day of the son of man is a, a similar language to the old testament that talks about the day of the lord the day of the lord in other words it's the day when god breaks into history and be, writes some wrongs and the day of uh, in the old testament the, the the people were longing for the day of the son of uh, the day of the lord and the prophet warned them don't don't want the, don't seek after the day of the Lord because when it comes it will be a, it will be a day of judgment and um, and so uh, here too we see that uh, uh, people are are looking for that intervention of God in history when is that intervention of God in history going to come and Jesus said don't go looking here or there because when it happens you will truly know it is going to happen now we have to discuss this because uh, generally speaking uh, people consider this to be a reference to the second coming of Christ to the time when Jesus is coming back the day of the son of man is the day when he returns well let's just hold that thought because Jesus goes on to uh, talk about how he has to suffer and be rejected by this generation and that of course was the generation of Jesus time and we know that this involved his uh, arrest trial uh, uh, his, his suffering his, 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 his beating and then his, his, res his death uh, of course he, he's, he's talking about that here but then Jesus goes on to say uh, when this the, the day of the son of man is going to be such after he has suffered by this generation that life is going to go on actually quite normally uh, just as it was in the days of Noah so too it will be in the day of the son of man whatever that means they were uh, this is the day of Noah they were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day Noah had entered the uh, ark entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them in other words life was going on everybody thought it was okay and then judgment came and that judgment here is called the day of the son of man likewise and now there's another example just as it was in the days of Lot they were eating and drinking buying and selling planting and building but on the day that Lot left Sodom it rained fire and sulfur from heaven and destroyed them all so again there's this picture uh, you know, when, when is the day of the son of man coming or uh, uh, you know how do we know and Jesus said well first of all I will suffer and then life will go on as if nothing's going to happen and then what will happen is uh, the judgment will come and that judgment is identified as the day or, or days of the son of man uh, and then in verse 31 we get these words on that day anyone on the housetop who has belongings in the house must not come down and take them away and otherwise anyone in the field must not turn back remember Lot's wife and of course she turned back and 
um, and was turned into a pillar of salt. Those who try to make their life secure will lose it, but those who life, lose their life will keep it. And interestingly enough, Matthew uses this phrase in Matthew 10:29 as a dimension of discipleship and a challenge of discipleship. And Jesus here uh, um, uh, uses it, and indeed Luke puts it here in in the words of Jesus speaking that that things must not be significant to us because if they are then we could end up losing our life because rather than fleeing they become important and then we come into the judgment that is going to happen I tell you on that night there will be two in one bed one will be taken the other left two women grinding mill together one will be taken and uh, the other left and uh, uh, we consider verse 37 in a moment but uh, the question is is what is this talking about and generally speaking people have understood this to be uh, talking about the second coming the day of the son of man uh, w will happen when we're not expecting it and there will be a rapture with some taken and, and others not taken uh, but I want to suggest to you that this is not what's going on here and the reason is very simple if it's the second coming of Christ then why would Jesus urge people to flee where are people going to flee to in the uh, return of Christ with the Son of Man coming if this is the end if, if there is I don't believe there is but if there is a secret rapture then of course it's going to happen we don't have to do anything if the teaching about a secret rapture is true those who love Christ will be raptured uh, but here it's not talking about that there's an urgency that people should flee they should not be tempted to grab things and make things important but rather they need to flee and if this is the return of Christ then then why on earth would people need to to be bothered about these things and, and particularly where would we flee to there's nowhere to go uh, I think rather that what we have here is not talking a talk about the second coming but it's talk about the judgment that's going to come on Jerusalem and the day of the son of man and the phrase the son of man in his day and uh, uh, the, the, the references we have here I believe go back to Daniel 7 and uh, I believe we've mentioned this this marvellous passage that, uh, that uh, we have in Daniel 7 where Daniel sees a vision of the beasts and he gets a glimpse into heaven and uh, there is the one of the ancient of days that is seated on the throne and then what we see here in 713 as I watched in the vi night visions I saw one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven coming with the clouds of heaven uh, and this is the phrase that Jesus uses and this is a phrase that's often thought to be talking about the second coming but when we look at this passage here where this phrase originates we need to read how we need to notice how uh, it says he's coming with the clouds of heaven but the next line says he came to the ancient one and was presented before him to him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all the people's nations and languages should serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away his kingship one that will never be destroyed and I want to suggest to you that the day of the son of man is not talking about the second coming but it's talking firstly about Jesus ascension after his death and resurrection uh, where he was seated at the right hand of the throne of God and what we read here is that is the son of man was vindicated by being seating, seated at the right hand of the father 
and uh, the right hand of God and so the coming of the Son of Man has to do with the vindication of Jesus that he truly is the Messiah the Son of God and uh, what we have with the fall of Jerusalem and we'll talk about this in a bit more detail when we come to chapter 21 uh, what we have is the vindication that Jesus was indeed who he said he was and tragically uh, the rejection of the Jewish nation as a whole uh, ended up to the uh, of their judgment even as we've seen in the Old Testament the rejection of the Jewish nation as a whole of uh, the prophets also led to judgment and so uh, what this uh, is talking about it would seem is that the day of the Son of Man uh, is speaking about the judgment that's going to come on Jerusalem even as in the Old Testament the day of the Lord speaks about God's intervention into history so often bringing judgment and that would make sense of the last verse 2, 37 and they asked him where Lord and he said to them where the corpse is there the vultures or the eagles will be gathered now uh, some uh, the, the translation can be either vulture or eagle if it's eagle then it would be speaking about Rome that was represented with the Roman eagle if it's talking about vultures then of course it's talking about uh, the destruction of Jerusalem and that's why people needed to flee because uh when when the day of the Son of Man is revealed, i.e. there is judgment that comes upon Jerusalem, they needed to flee. And when we come to chapter 30, uh, 21, we will see what happened historically there and how the Christians heeded the word of Jesus and they did flee. And it was urgent that they, f they, that they got out quickly. There's an urgency here. And indeed they went to safety. And, and so... Uh, the fact that life would go on in normal like it, the days of Noah and Lot and marriage and this kind of thing they need to be prepared and ready and as soon as it was important they and, and, and they were aware of judgment upon Jerusalem they needed to flee and they needed to get out and co so if you turn to chapter 19 there's another very moving passage and uh, the the setting of this passage is quite remarkable the passage is 19 verse 41 the setting is that Jesus has now come to the end of what we call the travel narrative and he is uh, coming into Jerusalem we have this very significant parable uh, in 1911 of the pounds uh, but also of the citizens that hated this one that was going to be king uh, very significant as it is talking about what was about to happen we have Jesus going into Jerusalem and after that event we have verse 41 chapter 19 and as he came near and saw the city he wept over it and again we see the, the broken heart of Jesus because he knew what was going to happen if you even knew had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace but now they are hidden from your eyes indeed the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you surround you in and hem you in on every side they will crush you to the ground you and your children within you and they will not leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visita visitation scary and tragic and uh, with that a very clear passage talking of the fall of Jerusalem and Jesus weeping because of what was going to happen and then he goes in and cleanses the temple uh, and then as you go into chapter 20 uh, what you'll notice is just one conflict story after another until we come to chapter 21 uh, before we look at that just very quickly to mention another very moving passage in 23 
verse 28 and this is when Jesus was on the road uh, with the cross to be crucified there were these women and we read this Jesus turned to them verse 28 and said daughters of Jerusalem do not weep for me but weep for yourself and your children for the days are surely coming when they will say blessed are the barren the womb that never bore and the breast that never nursed and then they will begin to say to the mountains fall on us and to the hills cover us for they do not for if they do this when the wood is green what will happen when it is dry and uh, a very powerful statement of the judgment that is coming uh, so now please turn to chapter 21 and uh, we'll look at verse 5 to the end of the chapter this is known historically as the Olivet Discourse it's repeated in Matthew 24 and Mark uh, 13 and each of those gospel writers have their own focus and their own emphasis even though it's talking about the same event and Luke does as well uh, uh, we read uh, that Jesus had been in the temple and was leaving the temple and uh, in Luke's account verse 5 we uh, read that when some were speaking about the temple how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God he said now the, the, the other synoptics talk about the disciples but uh, Luke tends to be more general and, uh, and here it is, is the people and they were talking about this this magnificent uh, uh, magnificent building and truly it was we know from history and historical sources that this temple Herod's temple was uh, absolutely magnificent really superb we we read that the stones it speaks about the stones here in verse 5 the stones were 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 pure white and uh, very strong says Josephus and each of their length was 25 cubits their height 8 cubits their breadth 12 cubits and so what we're talking here is about uh, 11.3 meters by 6.5 meters by 5.5 uh, meters or uh, 30 seven feet by 12 feet by 18 feet we're talking huge 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 stones beautifully crafted uh, notice what Josephus says about the temple now the outward face of the temple in its front wanted nothing that was real was likely to surprise either a man's mind or his eyes for it was covered all over with plates of gold of great weight and at the first rising of the sun reflected back a very fiery splendor and made those who forced themselves to look upon it to turn their eyes away for as they would have done at the sun's own rays but this temple appeared to strangers when they were at a distance like a mountain covered with snow for as to those parts that were not covered with gold they were exceeding white of its stones some of them were 20 meters by by two meters by by three meters uh, these are approximate sizes uh, and so Josephus boasting about the magnificence of the temple and so when the disciples were leaving this temple or the people leaving the temple uh, uh, they were reflecting and talking about the beauty of a magnificent building and then what Jesus said must have really shocked them verse 6 as for those things that you see the days will come when not one stone will be left to another all will be thrown down now this really really must have shocked them uh, because uh, in the understanding of the Jews this was indeed the dwelling place of Yahweh and uh, uh, how could it be thrown down and so that's why in verse 7 we read they they and again uh, it's general uh, the other synoptic writers have the disciples or a few of the disciples uh, they asked him teacher 
And I want you to notice the question they asked. Very important. When will this be? And what will be the sign that this is about to take place? In other words, two questions. When is the temple going to be destroyed? And what sign is there going to be that this is going to happen? Now, I, I want to stress this because so often we can come to a passive with a, with a preconceived idea of what it's going to say but we need to know that, that what follows Jesus is answering these two questions the when question and the sign question but I also want you to know the pastoral concern that Jesus has for in verse 8 it says and then he said be aware that you are not led astray for many will come in my name saying I am he and the time is near do not go after them uh, in other words uh, when uh, the temple is attacked or, or when these things happen do not be taken in by those who are claiming to uh, to, to have answers to the national problems and either be involved in defending the temple or attacking the temple don't be taken up by these people who would be planning such things do not go after those that say the time is near in other words don't be deceived and he goes on uh, warning them against messianic pretenders that is those that are claiming to be the messiah when you hear of wars and, and insurrections do not be terrified for these things must take place first but the end will not follow immediately and the end there is the end of Jerusalem that's the context of this passage then he said to them nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom there will be great earthquakes and in various places uh, in various places famines and plagues and there will be dreadful uh, potents and great wonders uh, great signs in the heavens and I want to suggest to you that the language here is apocalyptic language uh, it was a, a form of, of writing at that time that was very common to them where historical events are talking about with exaggerated language uh, we see this in Daniel to some extent uh, a bit in the book of Revelation but it was a very common genre of literature at the time uh, things that were happening uh, physical things spoken about in graphic and very uh, uh, a very exaggerated language and, and we can see this but let's turn to this because this is uh, important to notice in Isaiah 13 is probably one of the best examples of this kind of language and, and the fact it was well known and common we have in chapter 13 of Isaiah these words Uh, verse 10 for the stars of the heaven and their constellations will not give their light and the sun will be dark uh, at its rising and the moon will not shed its light I will punish the world for its evil uh, the wicked for their iniquity and put an end to the pride of the arrogance and, and so on and so forth and, um, and we see there about the heavens coming to an end and, and the stars not giving their light we, we, we see the sun and the moon affected and, and we read that and we think this must be the end of the world but actually when you read Isaiah 13 you find it's actually a prophecy against Babylon and it's used in this exaggerated graphic language to talk about the destruction of Babylon and we have to uh, ask the question why is this why is this the case the fall of Babylon was of course a big deal back then but it certainly didn't bring an end to the world and it, it wasn't the end of the sun and the moon and the stars but the point is is that when a nation falls when there's a major change in the earth or when something major like this happens uh, often this uh, apocalyptic type language is used and I'm going to suggest to you that that's what we have here because remember the question that was asked of Jesus was about the destruction of the temple when is it going to happen and what is going to be uh, the sign 
and uh, and so the first thing that Jesus does is speaks from a pastoral concern when you see a wars and, and these um, uh, insurrections don't be terrified because the end is not yet when kingdom rises against kingdom there's earthquakes uh, and all these things happen uh, don't be concerned don't be concerned about it. and don't be concerned because the end is not yet now what is interesting is between the time that Jesus said these words and the fall of Jerusalem all of these things that Jesus prophesied here happened firstly there were many uh, messiahs who arose who or, or rather people who claimed to be a messiah uh, and we read from the ancient writings of, of uh, Simon Magnus was one he is the Simon spoken about in uh, Acts 8 uh, that he claimed to be God he claimed and, and said of himself I am the word of God I am the comforter I am the almighty I am all there is of God uh, Irenaeus says that Simon claimed to be the son of God uh, but particularly Josephus the writer uh, the historian who wrote at the time of of uh, the Apostle Paul and the fall of Jerusalem he says this now as for the affairs of the Jews they grew worse and worse continually for the country was again filled with robbers and impostors that is people claiming to be the Messiah who deluded the multitudes in other words people were hungry for a leader hungry for somebody to deliver them and when somebody claimed to be a, a Messiah they got a hearing Yet Felix, that's a Roman procurator, did catch them and put to death many of these impostors every day together with the robbers. And so we, we know there's impostors and uh, we read even in Acts 21, 38 how there's a speaking about these kind of things. The other thing that uh, Josephus uh, tells us and other sources is that this period between uh, AD 30 and 70, the 40 years, was a time of unparalleled uh, tumult and wars. AD 69 was known as the year of the four emperors, where there was civil war in Rome. There were four Roman emperors that came to a violent death in 18 months. There were several invasions by the Parthians, that is, the people on the eastern frontiers of the Roman Empire. There was an uprising of the Jews in Cilicia uh, where 50,000 Jews were slain. In Caesarea, 20,000 Jews were killed in battle by the Syrians. The hostility between the Jews and the Syrians divided many towns and villages into armed camps. As far as earthquakes, earthquakes were concerned, before AD 70 there were earthquakes in, in Crete, in Smyrna, uh, Miletus, Chios, Samos, Laodicea, Hariopolis, Colossae, Rome, Judea and the city of Pompeii was devastated by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. and so uh, uh, there were earthquakes and of course famines follow earthquakes uh, because of the disruption to the farming cycle and so uh, Jesus was saying when these things happen don't be alarmed don't be terrified these things in themselves are not a sign that the end is going to happen that is the fall of Jerusalem and then there's more of a pastoral concern in verse 12 uh, but before all this occurs they will arrest you and persecute you they will hand you over to the synagogues and prisons and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name this is verse 12 following chapter 21 these will give you an opportunity to testify now this is exactly what we see happening in Acts and presumably happened in many other places also but we have uh, we have the Apostle Paul before King, of Gri uh, King Agrippa and Festus and Felix and uh, in the synagogues and uh, ministering this is exactly what happened in the book of Acts 
So make up your mind not to prepare your defence in advance, but I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. And you will be uh, betrayed, even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish, for by your endurance you will gain my souls. Now, uh, uh, the interesting thing is that he says some will be put to death but a hair of your head will not perish and of course what he's talking here is about even though death may come uh, they will live eternally uh, because uh, what would happen is they'd be ushered in to God's eternal presence and so before he answers the question that they've asked when will the temple be destroyed and what will be the sign he goes first of all to talk about the pastoral issues between that moment they asked the question uh, about 30 AD 30 and the fall of Jerusalem AD 70 he addresses that pastoral concern and then in verse 20 he actually answers their question and what will, when will this happen and what will be the sign we have it in verse 20 when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies then know that its desolation is come near then those in Judea must flee to the mountains and those outside the city must leave it and those out in the country must not enter it for these are days of vengeance uh, as a fulfillment of all that is wit written uh, in other words the sign is that Jerusalem is going to fall uh, that Jerusalem is going to fall is that it's going to be surrounded by armies and when you see this then you need to do something and what you need to do is you need to get is to flee and there's an urgency about the fleeing verse 23 woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing infants in those days for there will be great distress on the earth now the NIV says earth but the word could equally be land there will be great, great distress on the land and the wrath of this and the wrath of this people the Jewish people they will fall by the edge of the sword and be taken away as captives among all the nations and Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled and uh, and we know from history that this is exactly what happened we know that uh, uh, as the uh, zealots began to gain prominence in the period after Jesus that there were zealot bands that rose up and they began to attack the Romans and then there was a rebellion round about uh, AD 66 and uh, the uh, Romans were cleared out of Jerusalem the tower of Antonia was attacked and uh, they retreated and uh, it was Caesar who, uh, who, who called on Vespasian to take his legions and to recapture the uh, eastern Mediterranean area Judea, Samaria, Palace and uh, Galilee and Vespasian brought his troops down and city by city, village by village he attacked them uh, and destroyed the resistance until eventually he came to Jerusalem and his army surrounded Jerusalem. And uh, what Jesus is saying to them is that when the armies surround Jerusalem, then you need to flee. And uh, history tells us something very interesting. That Vespasian began a siege on Jerusalem and uh, and in Rome when the Caesar died the current Caesar Vespasian was called to Rome to become the new Caesar and during that time there was a lull in the siege of Jerusalem while that was happening and according to Eusebius the uh, church historian from ancient times that when that happened because of this and other prophecies all of the Christians left Jerusalem and they fled to the hills uh, across the Jordan to a city called Pella 
and therefore during the break in the siege every Christian, every believer in Jesus left and after Vespasian became emperor his son Titus took over the job of reconquering uh, Judea and uh, the Palestine area and the siege was again laid at Jerusalem but this time there was no Christian inside uh, there were zealots and there were other people but there were no uh, there were no Christians and and so we see here the urgency the language that is used whereby Jesus is saying when you see these armies do not be taken up with trying to protect your property or protect your things there's an urgency here you've got to get out uh, because there's going to be great wrath against the land and against the people they will fall by the edge of the sword verse 24 and taken captive among the nations and in the account of Josephus who writes extensively on this uh, the time inside Jerusalem during the siege was, uh, was, was horrific beyond words the pain, the suffering and the agony uh, was uh, enormous and then when the Romans finally break through the defences there was so much blood and killing uh, that he says the blood of the people put out the fires that were burning in Jerusalem and many thousands 30,000 or more were captured and they were sent to the uh, mines of Egypt to work the mines and taken into captivity and uh, it is a, a really uh, a, a very dark period of time in the history of Jerusalem and for the Jews and Jesus is saying here that what you need to do is you need to flee and this is why I think in chapter 13 the day of the son of man that's been spoken about there is uh, uh, sorry in in chapter chapter 17 the day of the son of man there where there's the urgency to flee and to get out is talking about the fall of Jerusalem if this in chapter 17 is talking about the second coming then there's no point to flee there's nowhere to go but if the day of the son of man is talking about the vindication of Jesus and the judgment of Jerusalem uh, then certainly there was a place to flee and history tells us they fled to Pella now just to bring this chapter to a conclusion we then have probably the most difficult chapter and this is a portion should I say of this chapter verse 25 following uh, many uh, many expositors would say that this is talking about the second coming uh, that that what happens is that Luke switches to talk about the second coming and indeed uh, that may be the case but uh, but I think that uh, this is continuing to talk about the fall of Jerusalem but it is using that apocalyptic exaggerated language because what is happening here is absolutely enormous it's enormous theologically because from this point onwards Jerusalem was no longer the center of religion no longer the temple no longer existed no longer could there be sacrifices for the Christian church Jerusalem was no longer the center of Christianity uh, we are entering into a new theological age uh, Jerusalem is no longer the center of the theological world so enormous things were happening but also uh, I want you to notice I want you to know verse 29 following uh, let's look at that first then he told them a parable look at the fig tree and all the trees and as soon as you see as soon as they sprout leaves you can see for yourselves and know that the summer is already near so when you see these things taking place then you know the kingdom of God is near truly I tell you this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place heaven and earth will pass away but my words will not pass away now the, the, the big thing about this paragraph is the phrase 
this generation. And the question is, what generation is being referred to? Now, throughout the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, whenever the phrase, this generation is used, it is always referring to the generation of Jesus. And uh, the people have tried to say that the phrase here and in the parallels of, of Matthew 24, Mark 13, when the phrase this generation is used, it's, it's referring to the generation that the fig tree uh, sprouts forth its leaves. And people have argued that the fig tree talks about the nation of Israel and that the nation of Israel sprouted its leaves when it was reinstituted and began again in uh, 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 1948. Now, the fact that that would happen is truly a miracle, uh, an enormous miracle. But what people have done have said that in the generation, uh, that generation, then all these things would happen and and they've considered these things being the return of Jesus. And and so the church has gone through a very painful and tragic period where there were so many predictions of the return of Christ, especially around the year 1988, and they have all failed and uh, brought discredit to the church and discredit to the word of God. And I would want to suggest to you that we need to see this generation referring to the very generation of Jesus' time and at his time. And the fall of Jerusalem was within the generation of Jesus speaking. It was 40 years uh, after Jesus spoke these words. And the fig tree there is uh, is simply saying that we... Uh, we do read signs we, we we look at plants we look at trees or or whatever and when they sprout we know the season's coming and Jesus is simply saying I've given you signs and the sign is the, the surrounding of Jerusalem with the armies so when that happens you need to know that the, that it is coming that it is happening because my word is true now uh, if indeed this is speaking about the fall of Jerusalem which certainly it it would seem to be we then come to the verses 25 through 27 and uh, and I would suggest to you that what we have here is the same kind of language that we looked at in Isaiah 13 even as it speaks about in Isaiah 13 the sun and moon not giving their light and the stars being no more and it's talking about the fall of Babylon so we have this apocalyptic exaggerated language to talk about the historical event of the fall of Jerusalem because it it was an enormous event there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on the earth distress among nations confused by the roaring uh, of the sea and the waves people will faint with fear and foreboding for what is coming upon the world for the powers of the heavens will be shaken and they will see the son of man coming in a cloud with great power and glory now remember Daniel 7 the son of man came on the cloud and he came to the son of man and he was vindicated and I would suggest that this is talking about the vindication of Jesus and the vindication of those who followed him. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your hands because your redemption is drawing near. And truly, uh, the, the redemption of the church did draw near in the sense that no longer was Jerusalem attacking and, and persecuting Christians. Uh, the church was vindicated as the Israel of fulfillment. They escaped to the, the to the land of uh, the city of Pella and uh, and there was a collapse of the persecution by the Jewish authorities and remember how Jesus had said in this very same passage before the judgment you will be persecuted handed over to synagogues brought before kings and governors and uh, these things will happen and you will be hated and then Jesus says, when this happens, when, when uh, Jerusalem falls, your vindication will be there. And so uh, I would argue and suggest to you 
that what we have in Luke 21 the whole chapter is the culmination of these different references to Jerusalem the temple and God's judgment on it but let's remind ourselves that it was not a vindictive God doing this but it was the God who in the person of Jesus wept over Jerusalem because Jerusalem would not respond to the message and be like those chicks coming under the wings of the mother hen but those that did respond those that did obey Jesus those that accepted him and entered into his kingdom they were protected and they were looked after because he warned them when these happen, things happen don't be concerned about your material possessions in Jerusalem but get out, urgent, flee and, uh, and you will be protected and so we, uh, we finish off here with an exhortation for them to be on their guard and, uh, and to be praying now uh, what is interesting of course is in the Old Testament every day of the Lord uh, and the, the temporal judgment that came in time in some way is a precursor of that final judgment that's coming and even though this is talking about the fall of Jerusalem there's no doubt this is an echo of what is to come and it would seem that in Mark and in Matthew the way those gospel writers have presented the uh, fall of Jerusalem they've included this added dimension of the fall of Jerusalem being a, a, a foretaste of that final judgment that's coming but uh, I would suggest to you that what Luke does is his focus is back then on what was happening and the, 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 the tragedy of the fall of Jerusalem but when you put this together with Acts and you see how Jerusalem uh, is shown in Acts as being the place of, of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and then the, 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 the new church and then the expansion from Jerusalem in Luke's thinking uh, we end up in Rome and uh, again let me mention how Luke has the longest speech he gives us is the speech of Stephen who makes this declaration that resulted in his death and that is God no longer lives in a building made with hands the Jerusalem uh, the Jerusalem situation is no longer relevant because the God of Luke and the God of the Bible is a God of the whole earth and God no longer is tied to a building indeed he never was but no longer is there a building that is his focus but rather his people who are uh, over and all over the face of the earth.